This is Ian Hartley. I am Warren Kay. And I am Sasha Steenbergen. Welcome to the Rediscovering God Dialogue. We invite you to join us as we endeavor to see Him more clearly. And love Him more dearly while following Him more nearly. We continue our, uh, our discussion on Genesis chapter 9, where we've looked at God's first post-flood speech. And to summarize it, uh, it was to multiply and fill the earth, and then you can eat meat, but don't eat blood. Mm -hmm. And we spent quite a bit of time on that. Uh, and then God's second post-flood speech uh, is concerned with the covenant promise an explanation of why we have a rainbow in the clouds periodically and includes the promise to never have a universal flood again um, this idea of the universality of the flood pops up multiple times and in various scenarios uh, the storyteller uh, moses is really insistent that this was a universal flood mm -hmm. anybody either of you two want to add something or can we go on no i think we're ready to move on yeah okay. i just i was gonna say i really enjoyed the lyrical way that the story was told by always adding in uh, repetition, which really kept that comfort of the story going for me. And are you thinking of the animals that scurry along the ground? That is correct. You know me well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so Sasha is in good voice. Will you read verse 18 and 19, please, of Genesis chapter 9? And we're talking about Noah's sons and the curse on Canaan. You mean verse eight and nine? Um, oh, sorry, I'm I'm wrong. Yeah, eighteen. You're right. Good. The sons of Noah who came out of the boat with their father were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. From these three sons of Noah came all the people who now populate the earth. So you've got it again that this is a universal flood because um, from these people come everyone who lives on the earth. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that only Ham uh, is mentioned as a descendant here. Uh, sorry, only Ham as a descendant mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you notice that? And th and that's because this section of chapter nine is going to focus on the curse on Canaan. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the order, uh, the birth order of the sons is interesting. So uh, you have to do a little sleuthing to figure out the birth order. So let's do it. Uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter 9 verse 24 Warren if you could read that please when Noah woke up from his stupor he learned that Ham his youngest son he learned what Ham his youngest son had done thank you so Ham is the youngest mm -hmm. and, and then uh, if we read 10 verse 21 Sasha Chapter mm -hmm. 10 of Genesis, verse 21, which sort of suggests that Japheth was the, the oh, older one. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But I looked in the 60 different English translations, and there are only a few of them that raise that possibility that Japheth was the older one. The rest all concur that Shem was older than Japheth. Okay. So the order seems to be Shem, Japheth, and Ham. Yeah, I never. And yet, when that. they mention, 
And yet when they mentioned, it's always Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Yeah, yeah. Ah. I couldn't find out, find any reason for that uh, uh, usage of the three names. Right. So we know that Shem was born in Noah's 500th year. Wow. Uh, we, we can get that from Genesis 5.32. We're not going to read it. Um, it actually says Shem, Japheth, and Ham were born when Noah was 500. So like uh, suggesting they were triplets, but it's just a usage. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So, look, the point is that Shem was 100 years old when the flood came. Yeah, that's just can't wrap my mind around people being that old. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys are just getting into your prime, really. So by the time you get to 100, I mean, you'll just really get going, I think. Yeah, so just, I think it's yeah. at that time that you can handle, you know, dealing with the flood and all that. <laughs> I'll send you a check. <laughs> so, um, Warren, if you can read verse 20, please, and 21. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside his tent. So we have no idea uh, how many years this was after the flood like he's cultivating the ground uh, he's planted a vineyard the vineyard's grown up he's harvested grapes he's made wine and uh, he's drunk and why he lies naked there's no explanation drunkenness and nakedness are not usually synonyms um, there's so many details that are missing here yeah. But in, but we do have a very interesting story going on here. And I remind you that Genesis is a book of origins for Israel. This is where they came from. And this is where uh, their explanations given, like, why is there a rainbow in the sky? Mm -hmm. And now this is an explanation of why Canaan was cursed. And it's retrospective. So uh, Moses is noticing or has been noticed orally and passed on to him that Canaan well, was really in bad shape compared to the rest of them or cursed in their language. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an explanation of why Canaan's in this bad situation. So I just make that explanation because sometimes we just focus on the trees every now and then, and we don't see the forest, the big picture of what's happening here. And the big picture can help you uh, understand what's going on. Yeah. So the, the Hebrew word used here for naked is erwat. Now, that's important. Uh, I'll show you why a little bit later. Hmm. Um, so notice that there's no comment on the fact that he made wine or that he got drunk it's all focused on nakedness yeah mm -hmm. I, I would have expected you know a little homily a little sermon here on the evils of wine and uh, drunkenness and so on I mean it's Every preacher with their salt would <laughs> have a sermon at this point. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this guy had a lot of time on his hands. He had to do something creative with the earth, you know? <clears throat> well, and this is the first mention of drunkenness in scripture, wouldn't it be? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the lack of any elaboration on what drunkenness means it seems to indicate that it it was just something that was happening. Yeah, it there's right. no judgment, there's no it's just a statement of fact. Yeah. This is what happened. Now the the focus on nakedness might be motivated uh by the 
memory of what happened to Adam and Eve. They also realized they were naked. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, so, Sasha, if you'll read 22 and 23, please. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way so that they would not see him naked. Okay, there's lots of stories we can ask uh, in these two verses. What was his motivation for telling his older brothers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really understand, I guess, the cultural significance here of the idea that they were so concerned that he should be covered up in his own tent. I mean, part of me thinks, listen, the man's had a long life. He's done a lot of things. If he wants to have a quiet afternoon uh, in the heat of the day, <laughs> resting in there in the nude, I don't see any issue with that. But mm -hmm. potentially this could be a really uh, worrisome thing if someone else maybe came upon him and they wanted to uh, save him embarrassment perhaps or something. But on its own, um, yeah, I don't know. I I visit Salt Spring a little more often now, and there's some pretty free bathing that goes on there. So it's it's clearly a different time and a different place. <laughs> yeah. are you, are, is this a confession or an observation? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, if you know me well, you'll you'll know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. I'll take it as a confession. <laughs> <laughs> so why why didn't Ham correct the situation? There must have been clothes there, uh, or a mm -hmm. blanket or something that it could. Uh, instead, he goes out and tell his he tells his brothers now. Um, I'm not sure of the motivation. It would it would suggest, and it's merely an assumption, that perhaps he didn't have the same level of respect for his father that his brothers did. Mm -hmm. And and he was more inclined to make fun of his father than his brothers who had still a lot of respect for their dad and they did what they felt was appropriate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now um, he has a bit of a shocker. Some people suggest that uh, Ham actually had sex with his father. And they do that on the basis of Leviticus 18 uh, from verse 7. So I want, uh, I want to read Leviticus 18 verse 7 uh, in the King James Version, because that's where this got started. Um, uh, Sasha, can you read that, please? Do you have a King Sasha. James version? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, Warren, Warren can access it quickly. Thank you, Warren. If you could dust off your King James version. <laughs> yes, yes, I had to go find it. <laughs> Leviticus, eighteen, verse seven. Eighteen, verse seven. The nakedness of your father. Or the nakedness of your mother, you shall not uncover. She is your mother, and you shall not uncover her nakedness. Okay, now, uh, Sasha, can you read that in the New Living Translation, please? Uh, yes. Uh, see the verses, chapter and verse again? Leviticus 18, verse yeah. 7. Relations with your mother. She is your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her. So you see what the King James Version referred to as uncovering nakedness simply refers to sexual relationship in the newer translations. Okay. And it's it's the same word used uh, for naked nakedness in the story of Noah and in this these commands in Leviticus. Er what? So this is why some people say that what the Bible is actually saying is that Ham had sex with his father. 
Hmm, that's very, yeah, that's, I've, I've heard that uh, referred to or mentioned to me once, only once before. Now I see where that comes from. Yeah. You look pained, Sasha. Well, I mean, I just feel like it brings up a whole host of questions for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So the first thing I thought of was, uh, what about Adam and Eve's nakedness? It's the same implication there. So I looked up the Hebrew word, and it's a different word, erom, mm. E-R-O-M. So I don't, it doesn't seem to me that there's any sexuality implied in the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Although some people read it that way, uh, that they were naked, and so this caused all sorts of problem thoughts um, in terms of sexuality. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, it seems to me the nakedness uh, referred to with Adam and Eve uh, is that of spiritual and emotional nakedness rather than a sexual overtone. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there is really that idea of an innocence that was taken away, that before uh, there was just such a, a blissful um, unknowingness about it. and. So I do think in some sense, it was in that sense, very taken or robbed or violated. Okay. Um, in Deuteronomy 27, 16, uh, well, we better read it. Warren, if you can read Deuteronomy 27, 16, uh, it states uh, that it is a sin to treat your parents with contempt. Uh, and this seems to be what's happening with Ham as he relates to his father's nakedness. Deuteronomy 27, 16. Cursed is anyone who dishonors father or mother. And all the people will reply, Amen. Yeah. Thank you. So now we come to Noah's... Uh, uh, sobering up and uh, uh, Sasha if you'll read 9 Genesis 9 and 24 and up to 26 please when Noah woke up from his stupor he learned what Ham his youngest son had done <clears throat> then he cursed Canaan the son of Ham May Canaan be cursed, may he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. And if you can read 27 too, please. Yeah. May God expand the territory of Japheth. May Japheth share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So this is really curious uh, to our way of thinking is uh, Ham is the one who dishonors his father, but his son Canaan is cursed. Yeah, that's that's a real puzzle. It doesn't make sense to me. So uh, there's something different with this culture than our culture because uh, Abraham goes down to, we'll get to the story later on. Abraham goes down to Egypt because of a famine and he tells the Egyptian Sarah is his sister. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a plague uh, affects Pharaoh because Abraham lied. Mm. Like, how do you, I mean, if somebody needs to suffer because of Abraham's lie about Sarah, surely it should be Abraham. Mm hmm. But aren't we putting like this causation picture into the thing? Like, couldn't it have been that it happened at the same time? Like that, that there was coincidence there rather than that that was being put on him? Okay, so that's a very real possibility. Um, but it, the way the stories are told is that uh, this could just be a coincidence. You know, um, but the way the story is told, it seems to be causation. Let me give you another one. 
David sins with Bathsheba and kills uh, Uriah, her husband, and Bathsheba is a child, and the child dies. Mm -hmm. Like, the child had no choice in this matter. No, but I would still stand up to say that a lot of babies and children died in those days. So I feel like we are writing in something after the fact, potentially. Like now that I hear it, I can't unhear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I that's, think, sorry, go ahead. That's, that's one of the characteristics of truth. Uh, uh, of course, gossip also sometimes but uh um yeah. there's some things like you've just said once you've heard them you can't unhear them once you've seen them you can't unsee them mm -hmm. they just they're there forever well so and I'm especially just, sorry i'm so sorry um, go ahead, go ahead. i was just gonna say in this story now with with noah um you know if it is true that uh about what you were saying about ham um I can imagine that as the father, you know, he, he probably was very angry or very upset with this. I mean, clearly if he had been violated in this way, um, there, there absolutely would have, I'm assuming been anger and potentially this was like known that he got really, really angry, but to say that he necessarily cursed him, you know, uh, I don't know that that would necessarily bring any effects further down the line. I think he could be just really angry. And I don't know that any human has that kind of power to make, you know, I mean, I think the intergenerational trauma for sure is the, the effect here. Um, if that's the case. Uh, but I don't think it's like, you know, and now God is going to send curses on you. Yeah. Um, so I'm very glad you raised the issue of coincidence and causation because we often mix these up. Um, so um, this story is a thousand years old when it's written down by Moses. Mm. So Moses can look back and see uh, that of the descendants of Noah, uh, the f second generation, his grandchildren. Canaan is the one who seems to carry the consequences of the, his father's attitude. Yeah. So um, it's important to remember this time lapse between when it happened and when the story is finally written down because uh, Moses can look back now and see what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, really lends itself to uh, Moses re um, writing in interpretation to explain what he saw happened and yeah. give, a, give a cause for it, which it, it may not be connected at all. Yeah. yeah. So this passage we've just read about the cursing, by the way, we don't curse people, we state the consequences. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, a synonym for cursing. Uh, and, and one needs to keep this in mind. So the people who kept slaves uh, used this passage to justify uh, their use of, in particular, Black African slaves uh, in England, the West Indies, and the Southern United States. And they were under the impression uh, that this, these Black people were the descendants of Ham. Mm. I see. So, so they used this, and the uh, anti-slavery movement did not use the Bible for their moral stance, because the Bible seems to support slavery. Right. And that begs that question, you know, are we kinder than God? And just thinking that, you know, people who don't support slavery uh, don't read the Bible in this, in this story that you're telling now. It's like, 
quite something. Now, I want to read um, Colossians 3, 22 to 25, because this is one of the uh, pro-slavery passages that's used, and just uh, point out one point. All right, Colossians what? Uh, 3, yep. 22 to 25. Okay. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrongs you have done. For God has no favorites. Yes. Uh, now have a look at the instruction in the same chapter uh, to husbands and yeah. to wives. Husbands, submit to your, or no, wives. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A Freudian slip there. <laughs> so sorry there. Oh, um, wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. And husbands? Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. And children? Always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. So in terms of instruction, Paul has one-liners for wives, husbands. But when it comes to slaves, he goes on and on and on. You know? Right. I, it just, I wanted you to notice that. It's wow. Like this uh, master-servant relationship is very important. And right. very accepted, and it's fine. This is just how you go about it. Wow. So I, I want to point out something to you, is that um, there's no evidence that the descendants of Ham are exclusively black people. The record okay. states that the Canaanites and Egyptians are his descendants. Um, and the land of Ham does not mean the land of Canaan. Only Canaan out of Ham's four children, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan, was cursed. So he had four children, and only Canaan was cursed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that the other three children, if you look at where they went and lived, they lived in Egypt, and they lived west of Egypt. Put lived west of Egypt in what we call Libya today. And then Mizraim uh, lived in southern Arabia. And Canaan, get this, lived where Israel is. Hmm. When the Israelites moved out from Egypt in the Exodus, they, were, they eventually displaced the Canaanites who lived on the coast uh, between Sidon and Gera, Sidon in the north, Gera in the south, and they lived as far east as Sodom and Gomorrah. Hmm. So pretty much exactly where the Israelites would establish themselves. Hmm. Right. And there's no hint that the Canaanites were black people. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of premising slavery on the cursing of one of Ham's children, uh, when others of his children lived in Africa, uh, there's just no basis for it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. That's certainly helpful to realize, to, to just, um, what can I say? erode that myth that has been developed uh, mm -hmm. around that. And I've actually heard um, an individual, uh, they, they believed that, that this was the case, that, that black people were cursed by God and they should be our servants. They should, you know, even still, you know, in, in my time, which is kind of uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of wow. course, this was a, a, a theory propagated by... 
mainly white people yes. to justify the enslavement of other peoples. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it speaks to the need to not just read the text, uh, but to think more globally about what is right, what is moral, what what is how would God want things and to realize that all people are equal and that it shouldn't be any um, slavery or, or anything like that. So, you know, it's astonishing to me that it took Christians 1800 years to realize that slavery was immoral. Yeah. I, agree. Um, I mean, the abolition of the slave trade uh, was around 1800 in the British uh, sphere of influence. And at that time, they had the greatest navy on earth so that they could actually enforce this. Uh, but 1800 years mm -hmm. of sincere uh, Bible-believing uh, friends of God, and they didn't get that it was immoral to keep other people as slaves. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, what's coming up for me is that um, even in, because I somehow I was surprised, I know this verse, or I know this passage of verses that you shared in Colossians 3. Um, and so, of course, you know, when I think about, well, Jesus is the true revelation of God. And then in my mind, partly, I think, well, everything in the New Testament should be safe to read, you know, that when I read it, I go, oh, yes, this is how God is or this is a true revelation of god um but i'm just being reminded about how um as i'm learning that god doesn't manipulate us or control our thinking and he is willing to risk his name being viewed in a bad way because he believes so strongly in freedom and that he even from his own you know disciple here who is writing something that isn't in line actually with how God operates, that he doesn't come down and go, oh, strike it from the record. That's not correct. That's not how I am. That it still stays in the Bible, that he is still bringing us forward and hopefully growing us more and more into an understanding of who his character is. And that now in the Old Testament, when we see these stories of genocide, we can actually now go and say, wow, you didn't actually come and kill people for misrepresenting you uh, or try to change it and go, you know, flash news flash, like that's actually not right. Um, and that he really is that strong a believer in allowing us to come and grow in understanding. So it's a pretty neat thought for me that even in the New Testament, he's not changing anything. Well, I congratulate you on your passionate long homily. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, no, it's right on. And I want to add to it by saying that the only time the divine human uh, combination uh, is perfect is in Jesus. Hmm. So you can have inspired uh, people, mostly men who write the Bible, they're inspired, but they're human beings. Yeah. And so you can expect they're going to mess some things up. Yeah. There is no perfection outside of uh, Jesus when you have a divine human combination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So um, we're on verse 28. And... Uh, Noah really? lived. Noah lived another three hundred year, three hundred and fifty years after the great flood. He lived nine hundred and fifty years, and then he died. And so Noah lived longer than Adam, who lived for nine hundred and thirty. And only Jared, who lived nine hundred and sixty-two years, and Methuselah, who lived nine hundred and sixty-nine years, lived longer than Noah. Hmm. I find this interesting because um, something changed with the flood because the length of people's lives 
decreased very rapidly. But whatever the uh, people had before the flood that kept them alive so long seems to have continued in Noah and also in Shem, who lived a very long time. Mm. Now, you know, some people say, well, it's eating meat that shortened our lives. Uh, other ideas are that there was a water canopy before the flood that protected us from the cosmic rays, um, which uh, change your DNA uh, or have some of the other effect on your body. It's just interesting to me that Noah still lived another 350 years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and nobody, the people that were born after the flood certainly didn't live anywhere near that long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Maybe he was a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I have to ask you a question. Are you a vegetarian? I am. So I'm now I'm really suspicious of your comment. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the benefits of these histories in Genesis is being reminded that there are consequences or what are called curses, uh, and they have far-reaching results in life. Uh, this is why the Bible knows no delay in making good choices. It has a constant call for making the right choice and doing that now. Mm -hmm. It never says, you know, in a couple of days, make this choice. It's now is the time. Delay means that bad choices have the possibility of ruining one's life. If only Adam and Eve had made the choice at the moment of temptation to stay loyal to God. If only David had made an instant decision to refuse the lust of his eyes when he saw Bathsheba. If only Ahab had decided to choose to follow the God Elijah revealed at the moment of decision on Mount Carmel. Um, so that's one of my takeaways uh, from stories like this in the book of Genesis, is that when, when you recognize that uh, you have a choice, make the right choice and make it now and stick with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah true that's good so uh this is the shortest podcast we've ever made and we <laughs> had to do it someday um anything else you want to add <laughs> uh there i found there were some yeah enlightening um ideas i guess i i'm not a reader of the old testament anymore because i'm scared of it i think still um, but I am, I'm glad that we are venturing forth and I feel like it's a very safe space to do that. So thank you. I hope you know that we're going to have to continue all the way through, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ian will have to live to be 350 years old. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. He's just getting started. <laughs> but this is terrible. Warren's implying I have to give up my favorite pork chops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're, oh, you're, I know you. You're a more strict vegetarian than I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, it's uh, good. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are happy to be in your presence. And we remember that you made us so that you could love us and serve us. You awesome. And we read these stories and we feel so self-righteous and so... <laughs> Um, pious and that we would have made a different choice and acted differently uh, and yet we are conscious in a sober moment like this of our own faults and failings uh, we want to speak well of you we want to do well for you uh, but we know ourselves and we cast ourselves upon you and we decide again at this moment to follow you because of your great love for us. 
Amen. 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 find the recording of our podcast on our website uh, as well as the PDF document that we've been using so you can follow along or at least see all the passages and so that website is rediscoveringgod.ca and on there there is the the, the PDF document the uh, link for the podcast as well as our YouTube link we are now on YouTube so if you want to see us live, then you can go and watch it on YouTube. Wonderful. And we'd also love to invite you to our Monday evening Zoom discussion where Ian and Warren lead us out. And um, we are currently going through the podcast uh, where we get to have discussion and really dive in a little deeper and get our, um, our, our most pressing questions answered. Um, it's a really wonderful time of fellowship and connection with the group. Um, we share in community and resources as well. We'd really love, love to have you join us. We're going to be meeting um, at 6.30 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, you just add in the link 403-506-9201. We'd love to see you. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can reach us at rediscoveringgod2020 at gmail.com. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you and know how this journey of rediscovering the God that Jesus knew is changing your life. Take care.